This is a devotional book by Ellen G. White. Conflict and Courage. Part 12. December. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ, and Him crucified. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. It had been Paul's custom to adopt an oratorical style in his preaching. He was a man fitted to speak before kings, before the great and learned men of Athens, and his intellectual acquirements were often of value to him in preparing the way for the gospel. He tried to do this in Athens, meeting eloquence with eloquence, philosophy with philosophy, and logic with logic, but he failed to meet with the success he had hoped for. His aftersight led him to understand that there was something needed above human wisdom. He must receive his power from a higher source. In order to convict and convert sinners, the Spirit of God must come into his work and sanctify every spiritual development. To Paul the cross was the one object of supreme interest. Ever since he had been arrested in his career of persecution against the followers of the crucified Nazarene he had never ceased to glory in the cross. He knew by personal experience that when a sinner once beholds the love of the Father, as seen in the sacrifice of his Son, and yields to the divine influence, a change of heart takes place, and henceforth Christ is all and in all. At the time of his conversion, Paul was inspired with a longing desire to help his fellow men to behold Jesus of Nazareth as the Son of the living God, mighty to transform and to save. Henceforth his life was wholly devoted to an effort to portray the love and power of the Crucified One. The Apostles' efforts were not confined to public speaking, there were many who could not have been reached in that way. He visited the sick and the sorrowing, comforted the afflicted, and lifted up the oppressed. And in all that he said and did, he magnified the name of Jesus. Paul realized that his sufficiency was not in himself, but in the presence of the Holy Spirit, whose gracious influence filled his heart. Self was hidden, Christ was revealed and exalted. In all things I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you, and so will I keep myself. Paul was a tent maker, and he supported himself by working at his trade. While working thus, he spoke of the gospel to those with whom he came in contact, and turned many souls from error to truth. He lost no opportunity of speaking of the Savior, or of helping those in trouble. The history of the Apostle Paul is a constant testimony that manual labor cannot be degrading. That it is not inconsistent with true greatness and elevation of human or Christian character. Those toil-worn hands, he deemed, detracted nothing from the force of his pathetic appeals, sensible, intelligent, and eloquent. Those toil-worn hands as he presented them before the people bore testimony that he was not chargeable to any man for his support. At times he also supported his fellow workers, himself suffering from hunger in order to relieve the necessities of others. He shared his earnings with Luke, and helped Timothy obtain the necessary equipment for his journey. Paul set an example against the sentiment, then gaining influence in the church, that the gospel could be proclaimed successfully only by those who were wholly freed from the necessity of physical toil. He illustrated in a practical way what might be done by consecrated laymen in many places where the people were unacquainted with the truths of the gospel. His course inspired many humble toilers with a desire to do what they could to advance the cause of God, while at the same time they supported themselves in daily labor. While some with special talents are chosen to devote all their energies to the work of teaching and preaching the gospel, many others, upon whom human hands have never been laid in ordination, are called to act an important part in soul-saving. The self-sacrificing servant of God who labors untiringly in word and doctrine, carries on his heart a heavy burden. His wages do not influence him in his labor. From heaven he received his commission, and to heaven he looks for his recompense when the work entrusted to him is done. And many that believed came, and confessed, and shew their deeds. Many of them also which used curious arts brought their books together, and burned them before all men. By burning their books on magic, the Ephesian converts showed that the things in which they had once delighted they now abhorred. It was by and through magic that they had especially offended God and imperiled their souls, and it was against magic that they showed such indignation. 
By retaining these books the disciples would have exposed themselves to temptation, by selling them they would have placed temptation in the way of others. They had renounced the kingdom of darkness, and to destroy its power they did not hesitate at any sacrifice. Thus truth triumphed over men's prejudices and their love of money. The influence of what had taken place was more widespread than even Paul realized. From Ephesus the news was widely circulated, and a strong impetus was given to the cause of Christ. Long after the Apostle himself had finished his course, these scenes lived in the memory of men and were the means of winning converts to the Gospel. It is fondly supposed that heathen superstitions have disappeared before the civilization of the twentieth century. But the Word of God and the stern testimony of facts declare that sorcery is practiced in this age as verily as in the days of the old-time magicians. The ancient system of magic is, in reality, the same as what is now known as modern spiritualism. Satan is finding access to thousands of minds by presenting himself under the guise of departed friends. The magicians of heathen times have their counterpart in the spiritualistic mediums, the clairvoyants, and the fortune-tellers of today. Could the veil be lifted from before our eyes, we should see evil angels employing all their arts to deceive and to destroy. Wherever an influence is exerted to cause men to forget God, their Satan is exercising his bewitching power. The Apostle's admonition to the Ephesian church should be heeded by the people of God today, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Don't let people look down on you because you are young, see that they look up to you because you are an example to them in your speech and behavior, in your love and faith and sincerity. Timothy was a mere lad when chosen by God as a teacher, but so fixed were his principles by a correct education that he was fitted for this important position. He bore his responsibilities with Christ-like meekness. He was faithful, steadfast, and true, and Paul selected him to be his companion in labor and travel. Lest Timothy should meet with slights because of his youthfulness. Paul wrote to him, Let no man despise your youth. He could safely do this, because Timothy was not self-sufficient, but continually sought guidance. There are many youth who move from impulse rather than from judgment. But Timothy inquired at every step, Is this the way of the Lord? He had no specially brilliant talents, but he consecrated all his abilities to the service of God, and this made his work valuable. The Lord found in him a mind that he could mold and fashion for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. God will use the youth today as he used Timothy, if they will submit to his guidance. It is your privilege to be God's missionaries. He calls upon you to work for your companions. Seek out those you know to be in danger, and in the love of Christ try to help them. How are they to know the Savior unless they see his virtues in his followers? The highest aim of our youth should not be to strain after something novel. There was none of this in the mind and work of Timothy. They should bear in mind that, in the hands of the enemy of all good, knowledge alone may be a power to destroy them. It was a very intellectual being, one who occupied a high position among the angelic throng, that finally became a rebel, and many a mind of superior intellectual attainments is now being led captive by his power. The youth should place themselves under the teaching of the Holy Scriptures, and weave them into their daily thoughts and practical life. Then they will possess the attributes classed as highest in the heavenly courts. From a child you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. We see the advantage that Timothy had in a correct example of piety and true godliness. Religion was the atmosphere of his home. The manifest spiritual power of the piety in the home kept him pure in speech, and free from all corrupting sentiments. God had commanded the Hebrews to teach their children His requirements and to make them acquainted with all His dealings with their fathers. This was one of the special duties of every parent, one that was not to be delegated to another. In the place of stranger lips the loving hearts of the father and mother were to give instruction to their children. Thoughts of God were to be associated with all the events of daily life. The mighty works of God in the deliverance of His people and the promises of the Redeemer to come were to be often recounted in the homes of Israel. The great truths of God's providence and of the future life were impressed on the young mind. 
It was trained to see God alike in the scenes of nature and the words of revelation. The stars of heaven, the trees and flowers of the field, the lofty mountains. The rippling brooks, all spoke of the Creator. The solemn service of sacrifice and worship at the sanctuary and the utterances of the prophets were a revelation of God. Such was the training of Moses in the lowly cabin home in Goshen, of Samuel, by the faithful Hannah, of David, in the hill dwelling at Bethlehem, of Daniel, before the scenes of the captivity separated him from the home of his fathers. Such, too, was the early life of Christ at Nazareth, such the training by which the child Timothy learned from the lips of his grandmother Lois, and his mother Eunice, the truths of Holy Writ. Parents, there is a great work for you to do for Jesus. Satan seeks to bind the children to himself as with bands of steel. And you can attain success in bringing them to Jesus only through determined personal effort. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Paul loved Timothy, his own son in the faith. The great apostle often drew the younger disciple out, questioning him in regard to scripture history, and as they traveled from place to place, he carefully taught him how to do successful work. The affection between Paul and Timothy began with Timothy's conversion, and the tie had strengthened as they had shared the hopes, the perils, and the toils of missionary life, till they seemed to be as one. The disparity in their ages and the difference in their characters made their love for each other more earnest. The ardent, zealous, indomitable spirit of Paul found repose and comfort in the mild, yielding, retiring disposition of Timothy. The faithful ministration and tender love of this tried companion had brightened many a dark hour in the Apostle's life. All that a son could be to a loved and honored father, the youthful Timothy was to the tried and lonely Paul. Paul loved Timothy because Timothy loved God. His intelligent knowledge of experimental piety and of the truth gave him distinction and influence. The piety and influence of his home life was not of a cheap order, but pure, sensible, and uncorrupted by false sentiments. The Word of God was the rule which guided Timothy. Impressions of the highest possible order were kept before his mind. His home instructors cooperated with God in educating this young man to bear the burdens that were to come upon him at an early age. In his work, Timothy constantly sought Paul's advice and instruction. He did not move from impulse, but exercised consideration and calm thought. The Holy Spirit found in him one who could be molded and fashioned as a temple for the indwelling of the Divine Presence. As the lessons of the Bible are wrought into the daily life, they have a deep and lasting influence upon the character. These lessons Timothy learned and practiced. I charge you therefore before God, and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at His appearing in His kingdom, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering in doctrine. In this his last letter to Timothy, Paul held up before the younger worker a high ideal, pointing out the duties devolving on him as a minister of Christ. Paul bids him preach the word, not the sayings and customs of men, to be ready to witness for God whenever opportunity should present itself, before large congregations and private circles, by the way and at the fireside, to friends and to enemies. Whether in safety or exposed to hardship and peril, reproach and loss. Fearing that Timothy's mild, Yielding disposition might lead him to shun an essential part of his work, Paul exhorted him to be faithful in reproving sin and even to rebuke with sharpness those who were guilty of gross evils. Yet he was to do this with all long-suffering and doctrine. He was to reveal the patience and love of Christ. To hate and reprove sin, and at the same time to show pity and tenderness for the sinner, is a difficult attainment. The more earnest our own efforts to attain to holiness of heart and life, the more acute will be our perception of sin and the more decided our disapproval of any deviation from the right. We must guard against undue severity toward the wrongdoer, but we must also be careful not to lose sight of the exceeding sinfulness of sin. There is need of showing Christ-like patience and love for the erring one, but there is also danger of showing so great toleration for his error that he will look upon himself as undeserving of reproof. With the growing contempt for God's law there is an increasing distaste for religion, an increase of pride, love of pleasure, 
disobedience to parents, and self-indulgence, and thoughtful minds everywhere are anxiously inquiring. What can be done to correct these alarming evils? The answer is found in Paul's exhortation to Timothy, preach the word. In the Bible are found the only safe principles of action. It is a transcript of the will of God, an expression of divine wisdom. Pick up Mark and bring him with you, for I find him a useful assistant. Mark's mother was a convert to the Christian religion, and her home at Jerusalem was an asylum for the disciples. Mark proposed to Paul and Barnabas that he should accompany them on their missionary tour. He felt the favor of God in his heart and longed to devote himself entirely to the work of the gospel ministry. Their way was toilsome, they encountered hardships and privations. And were beset with dangers on every side. But Paul and Barnabas had learned to trust God's power to deliver. Their hearts were filled with fervent love for perishing souls. As faithful shepherds in search of the lost sheep, they gave no thought to their own ease and convenience. Forgetful of self, they faltered not when weary, hungry, and cold. They had in view but one object, the salvation of those who had wandered far from the fold. Mark, overwhelmed with fear and discouragement, wavered for a time in his purpose to give himself wholeheartedly to the Lord's work. And used to hardships, he was disheartened by the perils and privations of the way. He had yet to learn to face danger and persecution and adversity with a brave heart. As the apostles advanced and still greater difficulties were apprehended, Mark was intimidated and, losing all courage, refused to go farther and return to Jerusalem. This desertion caused Paul to judge Mark unfavorably, and even severely, for a time. Barnabas, on the other hand, was inclined to excuse him because of his inexperience. He felt anxious that Mark should not abandon the ministry, for he saw in him qualifications that would fit him to be a useful worker for Christ. In after years his solicitude in Mark's behalf was richly rewarded, for the young man gave himself unreservedly to the Lord and to the work of proclaiming the gospel message in difficult fields. Under the blessing of God, and the wise training of Barnabas, he developed into a valuable worker. Paul was afterward reconciled to Mark and received him as a fellow laborer. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Among Paul's assistants at Rome were many of his former companions and fellow workers. Luke, the beloved physician, was with him still. Demas and Mark were also with him. Since the earlier years of his profession of faith, Mark's Christian experience had deepened. As he had studied more closely the life and death of Christ he had obtained clearer views of the Savior's mission, its toils and conflicts. Reading in the scars in Christ's hands and feet the marks of his service for humanity, and the length to which self-abnegation leads to save the lost and perishing, Mark had become willing to follow the Master in the path of self-sacrifice. Now, sharing the lot of Paul the prisoner. He understood better than ever before that it is infinite gain to win Christ, infinite loss to win the world and lose the soul for whose redemption the blood of Christ was shed. In the face of severe trial and adversity, Mark continued steadfast, a wise and beloved helper of the Apostle. Demas, steadfast for a time, afterward forsook the cause of Christ. In referring to this, Paul wrote, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. For worldly gain, Demas bartered every high and noble consideration. How short-sighted the exchange! Possessing only worldly wealth or honor, Demas was poor indeed, however much he might proudly call his own, while Mark, choosing to suffer for Christ's sake, possessed eternal riches, being accounted in heaven an heir of God and a joint heir with his Son. If we would permit our minds to dwell more upon Christ and the heavenly world, we should find a powerful stimulus and support in fighting the battles of the Lord. Pride and love of the world will lose their power as we contemplate the glories of that better land so soon to be our home. Beside the loveliness of Christ, all earthly attractions will seem of little worth. Not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, specially to me, but how much more unto you, both in the flesh, and in the Lord. Among those who gave their hearts to God through the labors of Paul in Rome was Onesimus, a pagan slave who had wronged his master, 
Philemon, a Christian believer in Colossus, and had escaped to Rome. In the kindness of his heart, Paul sought to relieve the poverty and distress of the wretched fugitive and then endeavored to shed the light of truth into his darkened mind. O Nisi Miss listened to the words of life, confessed his sins, and was converted to the faith of Christ. Paul counseled him to return without delay to Philemon, beg his forgiveness, and plan for the future. The Apostle promised to hold himself responsible for the sum of which Philemon had been robbed. It was a severe test for this servant thus to deliver himself up to the master he had wronged, but he had been truly converted, and he did not turn aside from this duty. Paul's letter to Philemon shows the influence of the gospel upon the relation between master and servant. Slaveholding was an established institution throughout the Roman Empire, and both masters and slaves were found in most of the churches for which Paul labored. It was not the Apostle's work to overturn arbitrarily or suddenly the established order of society. To attempt this would be to prevent the success of the Gospel. But he taught principles which struck at the very foundation of slavery in which, if carried into effect, would surely undermine the whole system. When converted, the slave became a member of the body of Christ, and as such was to be loved and treated as a brother, a fellow heir with his master to the blessings of God and the privileges of the gospel. On the other hand, servants were to perform their duties, not with eye service, as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Christianity makes a strong bond of union between master and slave, king and subject. They have been washed in the same blood, quickened by the same spirit, and they are made one in Christ Jesus. Let us lay aside every weight, and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith. In the Epistle to the Hebrews is pointed out the single-hearted purpose that should characterize the Christian's race for eternal life. Envy, malice, evil thinking, evil speaking, covetousness, these are weights that the Christian must lay aside if he would run successfully the race for immortality. Every habit or practice that leads into sin and brings dishonor upon Christ must be put away, whatever the sacrifice. Know you not, Paul asked, that they which run in a race run all, but one receives the prize. However eagerly and earnestly the runners might strive, the prize could be awarded to but one. Such is not the case in the Christian warfare. Not one who complies with the conditions will be disappointed at the end of the race. The race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong. The weakest saint, as well as the strongest, may wear the crown of immortal glory. That he might not run uncertainly or at random in the Christian race, Paul subjected himself to severe training. The words, I keep under my body, literally mean to beat back by severe discipline the desires, impulses, and passions. It was this single-hearted purpose to win the race for eternal life that Paul longed to see revealed in the lives of the Corinthian believers. He knew that in order to reach Christ's ideal for them, they had before them a life struggle from which there would be no release. He entreated them to strive lawfully, day by day seeking for piety and moral excellence. He pleaded with them to lay aside every weight and to press forward to the goal of perfection in Christ. In view of the issue at stake, nothing is small that will help or hinder. Every act casts its weight into the scale that determines life's victory or defeat. And the reward given to those who win will be in proportion to the energy and earnestness with which they have striven. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, rejoice. The great Apostle Paul was firm where duty and principle were at stake, but courtesy was a marked trait of his character, and this gave him access to the highest class of society. Paul never doubted the ability of God or his willingness to give him the grace he needed to live the life of a Christian. He does not live under a cloud of doubt, groping his way in the mist and darkness of uncertainty, complaining of hardship and trials. A voice of gladness, strong with hope and courage, sounds all along the line down to our time. Paul had a healthful religious experience. The love of Christ was his grand theme, and the constraining power that governed him. When in the most discouraging circumstances, which would have had a depressing influence upon halfway Christians, he is firm of heart, 
full of courage and hope and cheer. The same hope and cheerfulness is seen when he is upon the deck of the ship, the tempest beating about him, the ship going to pieces. He gives orders to the commander of the ship and preserves the lives of all on board. Although a prisoner, he is really the master of the ship, the freest and happiest man on board. When before kings and dignitaries of the earth, who held his life in their hands, he quailed not, for he had given his life to God, and it was hid in Christ. He softened, by his courtesy, the hearts of these men in power, men of fierce temper, wicked and corrupt though they were in heart and life. Propriety of deportment, the grace of true politeness, marked all his conduct. When he stretched out his hand, as was his custom in speaking, the clanking chains caused him no shame or embarrassment. He looked upon them as tokens of honor, and rejoiced that he could suffer for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. His reasoning was so clear and convincing that it made the profligate king tremble. Grace, like an angel of mercy, makes his voice heard sweet and clear, repeating the story of the cross, the matchless love of Jesus. This one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul did many things. He was a wise teacher. His many letters are full of instructive lessons setting forth correct principles. He worked with his hands. For he was a tent maker, and in this way earned his daily bread. He carried a heavy burden for the churches. He strove most earnestly to present their errors before them, that they might correct them, and not be deceived and led away from God. He was always seeking to help them in their difficulties, and yet he declares, One thing I do. The responsibilities of his life were many, yet he kept always before him this one thing. The constant sense of the presence of God constrained him to keep his eye, ever looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of his faith. The great purpose that constrained Paul to press forward in the face of hardship and difficulty should lead every Christian worker to consecrate himself wholly to God's service. Worldly attractions will be presented to draw his attention from the Saviour, but he is to press on toward the goal, showing to the world, to angels, and to men that the hope of seeing the face of God is worth all the effort and sacrifice that the attainment of this hope demands. The lowliest disciple of Christ may become an inhabitant of heaven, an heir of God to an inheritance incorruptible, and that fades not away. Oh that every one might make choice of the heavenly gift, become an heir of God to that inheritance whose title is secure from any destroyer, world without end. Oh, choose not the world, but choose the better inheritance. Press, urge your way toward the mark for the prize of your high calling in Christ Jesus. Soon we shall witness the coronation of our King. Those whose lives have been hidden with Christ, those who on this earth have fought the good fight of faith, will shine forth with the Redeemer's glory in the kingdom of God. I stand at Caesar's judgment seat. Where I ought to be judged. For if I be an offender, or have committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die, but if there be none of these things whereof these accuse me, no man may deliver me unto them. I appeal unto Caesar. Once more, because of hatred born of bigotry and self-righteousness, a servant of God was driven to turn for protection to the heathen. It was this same hatred that forced the prophet Elijah to flee for succor to the widow of Sarepta, and that forced the heralds of the gospel to turn from the Jews to proclaim their message to the Gentiles. And this hatred the people of God living in this age have yet to meet. Among many of the professing followers of Christ there is the same pride. Formalism and selfishness, the same spirit of oppression, that held so large a place in the Jewish heart. In the great crisis through which they are soon to pass, the faithful servants of God will encounter the same hardness of heart, the same cruel determination, the same unyielding hatred. All who in that evil day would fearlessly serve God according to the dictates of conscience, will need courage, firmness, and a knowledge of God and His Word, for those who are true to God will be persecuted, their motives will be impugned, their best efforts misinterpreted, and their names cast out as evil. Satan will work with all his deceptive power to influence the heart and becloud the understanding, to make evil appear good, and good evil. God desires His people to prepare for the soon-coming crisis. 
those only who have brought their lives into conformity to the divine standard, will stand firm at that time of test and trial. When secular rulers unite with ministers of religion to dictate in matters of conscience. Then it will be seen who really fear and serve God. When the darkness is deepest, the light of a godlike character will shine the brightest. And while the enemies of truth are on every side, watching the Lord's servants for evil, God will watch over them for good. He will be to them as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. At my first answer no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. Notwithstanding the Lord stood with me, and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear. When Paul was summoned to appear before the Emperor Nero for trial, it was with the near prospect of certain death. Among the Christians at Rome, there was not one who came forward to stand by him in that trying hour. Paul before Nero, how striking the contrast! The name of Nero made the world tremble. To incur his displeasure was to lose property, liberty, life, and his frown was more to be dreaded than a pestilence. Without money, without friends, without counsel, the aged prisoner stood before Nero, the countenance of the emperor bearing the shameful record of the passions that raged within, the face of the accused telling of a heart at peace with God. How could Nero, a capricious, passionate, licentious tyrant, be expected to understand or appreciate the character and motives of this Son of God? The results of opposite systems of education stood that day contrasted, a life of unbounded self-indulgence and a life of entire self-sacrifice. Here were the representatives of two theories of life, all-absorbing selfishness, which counts nothing too valuable to be sacrificed for momentary gratification, and self-denying endurance, ready to give up life itself, if need be, for the good of others. The people and the judges looked at him in surprise. They had been present at many trials, and had looked upon many a criminal, but never had they seen a man wear a look of such holy calmness. His words struck a chord that vibrated in the hearts even of the most hardened. Truth, clear and convincing, overthrew error. The words spoken on this occasion were destined to shake nations. Faithful among the faithless, loyal among the disloyal, he stands as God's representative, and his voice is as a voice from heaven. His words are as a shout of victory above the roar of battle. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Through his long term of service, Paul had never faltered in his allegiance to his Saviour. Wherever he was, whether before scowling Pharisees, or Roman authorities, before the furious mob at Lystra, or the convicted sinners in the Macedonian dungeon, whether reasoning with the panic-stricken sailors on the shipwrecked vessel, or standing alone before Nero to plead for his life, he had never been ashamed of the cause he was advocating. The one great purpose of his Christian life had been to serve him whose name had once filled him with contempt, and from this purpose no opposition or persecution had been able to turn him aside. Paul's life was an exemplification of the truths he taught. And herein lay his power. His heart was filled with a deep, abiding sense of his responsibility, and he labored in close communion with him who is the fountain of justice, mercy, and truth. The love of the Savior was the undying motive that upheld him in his conflicts with self and in his struggles against evil as in the service of Christ he pressed forward against the unfriendliness of the world and the opposition of his enemies. What the Church needs in these days of peril is an army of workers who, like Paul, have educated themselves for usefulness, who have a deep experience in the things of God, and who are filled with earnestness and zeal. Sanctified, self-sacrificing men are needed. Men who will not shun trial and responsibility, men who are brave and true, men in whose hearts Christ is formed the hope of glory, and who with lips touched with holy fire will preach the word. Will our young men accept the holy trust at the hands of their fathers? Are they preparing to fill the vacancies made by the death of the faithful? Will the Apostles' charge be heeded, the call to duty be heard, amidst the incitements to selfishness and ambition that allure the youth? Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us, and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. 
Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. After the ascension of Christ, John stands forth as a faithful, earnest laborer for the Master. The love for Christ which glowed in his heart led him to put forth earnest, untiring labor for his fellow men, especially for his brethren in the Christian Church. Christ had bidden the first disciples love one another as he had loved them. After the descent of the Holy Spirit. When the disciples went forth to proclaim a living Savior, their one desire was the salvation of souls. They rejoiced in the sweetness of communion with saints. They were tender, thoughtful, self-denying, willing to make any sacrifice for the truth's sake. In their daily association with one another, they revealed the love that Christ had enjoined upon them. But gradually a change came. The believers began to look for defects in others. They lost sight of the Savior and His love. John, realizing that brotherly love was waning in the church, urged upon believers the constant need of this love. It is not the opposition of the world that most endangers the Church of Christ. It is the evil cherished in the hearts of believers that works their most grievous disaster and most surely retards the progress of God's cause. There is no surer way of weakening spirituality than by cherishing envy, suspicion, fault-finding, and evil surmising. On the other hand, the strongest witness that God has sent His Son into the world is the existence of harmony and union among men of varied dispositions who form His Church. Unbelievers are watching to see if the faith of professed Christians is exerting a sanctifying influence upon their lives, and they are quick to discern the defects in character, the inconsistencies in action. Christians are all members of one family, all children of the same Heavenly Father, with the same blessed hope of immortality. Very close and tender should be the tie that binds them together. Let us not love in word, the Apostle writes, but in deed and in truth. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. As the years went by and the number of believers grew, John labored with increasing fidelity and earnestness for his brethren. The times were full of peril for the church. Satanic delusions existed everywhere. By misrepresentation and falsehood the emissaries of Satan sought to arouse opposition against the doctrines of Christ, and in consequence dissensions and heresies were imperiling the church. Thus many were being led into the mazes of skepticism and delusion. John was filled with sadness as he saw these poisonous errors creeping into the church. He saw the dangers to which the church was exposed, and he met the emergency with promptness and decision. The epistles of John breathed the spirit of love. It seems as if he wrote with a pen dipped in love. But when he came in contact with those who were breaking the law of God, yet claiming that they were living without sin, he did not hesitate to warn them of their fearful deception. We are authorized to hold in the same estimation as did the beloved disciple those who claimed to abide in Christ while living in transgression of God's law. There exist in these last days evils similar to those that threatened the prosperity of the early church, and the teachings of the Apostle John on these points should be carefully heeded. While we are to love the souls for whom Christ died, we are to make no compromise with evil. We are not to unite with the rebellious and call this charity. God requires His people in this age of the world to stand for the right as unflinchingly as did John in opposition to soul-destroying errors. He declared what he knew, what he had seen and heard. Out of the abundance of a heart overflowing with love for the Savior he spoke, and no power could stay his words. So may every true believer be able, through his own experience, to set to his seal that God is true. He can bear witness to that which he has seen and heard and felt of the power of Christ. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself. Even as he is pure. John was a teacher of holiness, and in his letters to the church he laid down unerring rules for the conduct of Christians. He taught that the Christian must be pure in heart and life. Never should he be satisfied with an empty profession. As God is holy in his sphere, so fallen man, through faith in Christ, is to be holy in his sphere. There are those who profess holiness, who declare that they are wholly the Lord's, who claim a right to the promises of God, while refusing to render obedience to His commandments. 
These transgressors of the law claim everything that is promised to the children of God, but this is presumption on their part, for John tells us that true love for God will be revealed in obedience to all His commandments. It is not enough to believe the theory of truth, to make a profession of faith in Christ. He that says, I know Him, and keeps not His commandments, John wrote, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. John did not teach that salvation was to be earned by obedience, but that obedience was the fruit of faith and love. If we abide in Christ, if the love of God dwells in the heart, our feelings, our thoughts, our actions, will be in harmony with the will of God. There are many who, though striving to obey God's commandments, have little peace or joy. This lack in their experience is the result of a failure to exercise faith. They walk as it were in a salt land, a parched wilderness. They claim little, when they might claim much, for there is no limit to the promises of God. Such ones do not correctly represent the sanctification that comes through obedience to the truth. The Lord would have all His sons and daughters happy, peaceful, and obedient. Through the exercise of faith the believer comes into possession of these blessings. Through faith, every deficiency of character may be supplied, every defilement cleansed, every fault corrected, every excellence developed. Yes, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. In the experience of the Apostle John under persecution, there is a lesson of wonderful strength and comfort for the Christian. God does not prevent the plottings of wicked men, but He causes their devices to work for good to those who in trial and conflict maintain their faith and loyalty. It is the work of faith to rest in God in the darkest hour, to feel, however sorely tried and tempest-tossed, that our Father is at the helm. The eye of faith alone can look beyond the things of time to estimate aright the worth of the eternal riches. Jesus does not present to His followers the hope of attaining earthly glory and riches of living a life free from trial. Instead He calls upon them to follow Him in the path of self-denial and reproach. He who came to redeem the world was opposed by the united forces of evil. So it will be with all who will live godly in Christ Jesus. Persecution and reproach await all who are imbued with the Spirit of Christ. In all ages Satan has persecuted the people of God. He has tortured them and put them to death but in dying they became conquerors. They bore witness to the power of one mightier than Satan. Wicked men may torture and kill the body, but they cannot touch the life that is hid with Christ in God. They can incarcerate men and women in prison walls, but they cannot bind the Spirit. Through trial and persecution the glory, the character, of God is revealed in His chosen ones. They follow Christ through sore conflicts, they endure self-denial and experience bitter disappointments, but thus they learn the guilt and woe of sin, and they look upon it with abhorrence. Being partakers of Christ's sufferings, they can look beyond the gloom to the glory, saying, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Blessed are you, when men shall revile you, and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely, for my sake. Rejoice, and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. John lived to be very old. He witnessed the destruction of Jerusalem and the ruin of the stately temple. The last survivor of the disciples who had been intimately connected with the Saviour, his message had great influence in setting forth the fact that Jesus was the Messiah, the Redeemer of the world. The rulers of the Jews were filled with bitter hatred against John for his unwavering fidelity to the cause of Christ. They declared that their efforts against the Christians would avail nothing so long as John's testimony kept ringing in the ears of the people. In order that the miracles and teachings of Jesus might be forgotten, the voice of the bold witness must be silenced. John was accordingly summoned to Rome to be tried for his faith. Here before the authorities the apostles' doctrines were misstated. False witnesses accused him of teaching seditious heresies. John answered for himself in a clear and convincing manner. But the more convincing his testimony, the deeper was the hatred of his opposers. The emperor Domitian was filled with rage. 
he could neither dispute the reasoning of Christ's faithful advocate, nor match the power that attended his utterance of truth, yet he determined that he would silence his voice. John was cast into a cauldron of boiling oil, but the Lord preserved the life of his faithful servant, even as he preserved the three Hebrews in the fiery furnace. As the words were spoken, Thus perish all who believe in that deceiver, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, John declared, My master patiently submitted to all that Satan and his angels could devise to humiliate and torture him. He gave his life to save the world. I am honored in being permitted to suffer for his sake. I am a weak, sinful man. Christ was holy, harmless, undefiled. He did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. These words had their influence, and John was removed from the cauldron by the very men who had cast him in. Fear none of those things which you shall suffer, behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, be faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. By the emperor's decree John was banished to the Isle of Patmos, condemned for the word of God, and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Here, his enemies thought, his influence would no longer be felt, and he must finally die of hardship and distress. Patmos, a barren, rocky island in the Aegean Sea, had been chosen by the Roman government as a place of banishment for criminals, but to the servant of God this gloomy abode became the gate of heaven. Here, shut away from the busy scenes of life, and from the active labors of former years, he had the companionship of God and Christ and the heavenly angels, and from them he received instruction for the church for all future time. Among the cliffs and rocks of Patmos, John held communion with his Maker. He reviewed his past life, and at thought of the blessings he had received, peace filled his heart. In his isolated home John was able to study more closely than ever before the manifestations of divine power as recorded in the Book of Nature and in the pages of Inspiration. In former years his eyes had been greeted by the sight of forest-covered hills, green valleys, and fruitful plains, and in the beauties of nature it had ever been his delight to trace the wisdom and skill of the Creator. He was now surrounded by scenes that to many would appear gloomy and uninteresting, but to John it was otherwise. While his surroundings might be desolate and barren, the blue heavens that bent above him were as bright and beautiful as the skies above his loved Jerusalem. In the wild, rugged rocks, in the mysteries of the deep, in the glories of the firmament, he read important lessons. All bore the message of God's power and glory. By the rocks he was reminded of Christ, the rock of his strength, in whose shelter he could hide without fear. From the exiled apostle on rocky Patmos there went up the most ardent longing of soul after God, the most fervent prayers. And even to your old age I am he, and even to whore hairs will I carry you, I have made, and I will bear, even I will carry, and will deliver you. The history of John affords a striking illustration of the way in which God can use aged workers. When John was exiled to the Isle of Patmos, there were many who thought him to be past service. An old and broken reed, ready to fall at any time. But the Lord saw fit to use him still. Though banished from the scenes of his former labor, he did not cease to bear witness to the truth. Even in Patmos he made friends and converts. His was a message of joy, proclaiming a risen Savior. The most tender regard should be cherished for those whose life interest has been bound up with the work of God. These aged workers have stood faithful amid storm and trial. They may have infirmities, but they still possess talents that qualify them to stand in their place in God's cause. Though worn and unable to bear the heavier burdens that younger men can and should carry, the counsel they can give is of the highest value. They may have made mistakes, but from their failures they have learned to avoid errors and dangers, and are they not therefore competent to give wise counsel? They have borne test and trial, and though they have lost some of their vigor, the Lord does not lay them aside. He gives them special grace and wisdom. The Lord desires the younger laborers to gain wisdom, strength, and maturity by association with these faithful men. As those who have spent their lives in the service of Christ draw near to the close of their earthly ministry, they will be impressed by the Holy Spirit to recount the experiences they have had in connection with the work of God. 
the record of his wonderful dealings with his people, of his great goodness in delivering them from trial, should be repeated to those newly come to the faith. God desires the old and tried laborers to stand in their place, doing their part to save men and women from being swept downward by the mighty current of evil. He desires them to keep the armor until he bids them lay it down. O oh, give thanks unto the Lord! Call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people. Sing unto him, sing psalms unto him, talk of all his wondrous works. The dealings of God with his people should be often repeated. How frequently were the waymarks set up by the Lord in His dealings with ancient Israel. Lest they should forget the history of the past, He commanded Moses to frame these events into song, that parents might teach them to their children. They were to gather up memorials and to lay them up in sight. Special pains were taken to preserve them, that when the children should inquire concerning these things, the whole story might be repeated. Thus the providential dealings and the marked goodness and mercy of God in His care and deliverance of His people were kept in mind. We are exhorted to call to remembrance the former days, in which, after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of afflictions. For His people in this generation the Lord has wrought as a wonder-working God. We need often to recount God's goodness and to praise Him for His wonderful works. Let us not cast away our confidence, but have firm assurance firmer than ever before. Hitherto has the Lord helped us, and He will help us to the end. Let us look to the monumental pillars, reminders of what the Lord has done to comfort us and to save us from the hand of the destroyer. Let us keep fresh in our memory all the tender mercies that God has shown us, the tears He has wiped away, the pains He has soothed, the anxieties removed, the fears dispelled, the wants supplied, the blessings bestowed, thus strengthening ourselves for all that is before us through the remainder of our pilgrimage. We cannot but look forward to new perplexities in the coming conflict, but we may look on what is past as well as on what is to come, and say, Hitherto has the Lord helped us. As your days, so shall your strength be. The trial will not exceed the strength that shall be given us to bear it. Then let us take up our work just where we find it, believing that whatever may come, strength proportionate to the trial will be given. From the rising of the sun unto the going down of the same the Lord's name is to be praised. The Bible has little to say in praise of men. Little space is given to recounting the virtues of even the best men who have ever lived. This silence is not without purpose, it is not without a lesson. All the good qualities that men possess are the gift of God, their good deeds are performed by the grace of God through Christ. Since they owe all to God the glory of whatever they are or do belongs to Him alone, they are but instruments in His hands. More than this, as all the lessons of Bible history teach, it is a perilous thing to praise or exalt men, for if one comes to lose sight of his entire dependence on God, and to trust to his own strength, he is sure to fall. Man is contending with foes who are stronger than he. It is impossible for us in our own strength to maintain the conflict, and whatever diverts the mind from God, whatever leads to self-exaltation or to self-dependence, is surely preparing the way for our overthrow. The tenor of the Bible is to inculcate distrust of human power and to encourage trust in divine power. The truly converted soul is illuminated from on high. His words, his motives, his actions, may be misinterpreted and falsified, but he does not mind it because he has greater interests at stake. He is not ambitious for display, he does not crave the praise of men. His hope is in heaven, and he keeps straight on, with his eye fixed on Jesus. He does right because it is right. By their good works, Christ's followers are to bring glory, not to themselves, but to him through whose grace and power they have wrought. It is through the Holy Spirit that every good work is accomplished, and the Spirit is given to glorify, not the receiver, but the giver. When the light of Christ is shining in the soul, the lips will be filled with praise and thanksgiving to God. Your prayers, your performance of duty, your benevolence, your self-denial, will not be the theme of your thought or conversation. Jesus will be magnified, self will be hidden, and Christ will appear as all in all. The righteous also shall hold on his way, and he that has clean hands shall be stronger and stronger. Sacred history presents many illustrations of the results of true education. 
it presents many noble examples of men whose characters were formed under divine direction, men whose lives were a blessing to their fellow men and who stood in the world as representatives of God. Among these are Joseph and Daniel, Moses, Elisha, and Paul, the greatest statesman, the wisest legislator, one of the most faithful of reformers, and except him who spoke as never man spake, the most illustrious teacher that this world has known. In early life, just as they were passing from youth to manhood, Joseph and Daniel were separated from their homes and carried as captives to heathen lands. Especially was Joseph subject to the temptations that attend great changes of fortune. In his father's home a tenderly cherished child, in the house of Potiphar a slave, then a confidant and companion, a man of affairs, educated by study, observation, contact with men, in Pharaoh's dungeon a prisoner of state, condemned unjustly, without hope of vindication or prospect of release, called at a great crisis to the leadership of the nation, what enabled him to preserve his integrity. Loyalty to God, faith in the unseen, was Joseph's anchor. In this lay the hiding of his power. By their wisdom and justice, by the purity and benevolence of their daily life, by their devotion to the interests of the people, and the idolaters, Joseph and Daniel proved themselves true to the principles of their early training, true to him whose representative they were. What a life work was that of these noble Hebrews! The same mighty truths that were revealed through these men, God desires to reveal through the youth and the children of today. The history of Joseph and Daniel is an illustration of what he will do for those who yield themselves to him and with the whole heart seek to accomplish his purpose. What time I am afraid, I will trust in you. Only the sense of God's presence can banish the fear that, for the timid child, would make life a burden. Let him fix in his memory the promise, the angel of the Lord encamps round about them that fear him, and delivers them. Let him read that wonderful story of Elisha in the mountain city, and, between him and the hosts of armed foemen, a mighty encircling band of heavenly angels. Let him read how to Peter, in prison and condemned to death, God's angel appeared, how, past the armed guards. The massive doors and great iron gateway with their bolts and bars, the angel led God's servant forth in safety. Let him read of that scene on the sea, when to the tempest-tossed soldiers and sea men, worn with labor and watching and long fasting, Paul the prisoner, on his way to trial and execution, spoke those grand words of courage and hope, Be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am, and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, you must be brought before Caesar, and, lo, God has given you all them that sail with you. In the faith of this promise Paul assured his companions, There shall not an hair fall from the head of any of you. So it came to pass. Because there was in that ship one man through whom God could work, the whole shipload of heathen soldiers and sailors was preserved. They escaped all safe to land. These things were not written merely that we might read and wonder, but that the same faith which wrought in God's servants of old might work in us. In no less marked a manner than he wrought then will he work now wherever there are hearts of faith to be channels of his power. Let the self-distrustful, whose lack of self-reliance leads them to shrink from care and responsibility, be taught reliance upon God. Thus many a one who otherwise would be but a cipher in the world, perhaps only a helpless burden, will be able to say with the Apostle Paul, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me for a just man falls seven times, and rises up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. The pen of inspiration, true to its task, tells us of the sins that overcame Noah, Lot, Moses, Abraham, David, and Solomon, and that even Elijah's strong spirit sank under temptation during his fearful trial. Jonah's disobedience and Israel's idolatry are faithfully recorded. Peter's denial of Christ, the sharp contention of Paul and Barnabas, the failings and infirmities of the prophets and apostles, are all laid bare. There before us lie the lives of the believers, with all their faults and follies, which are intended as a lesson to all the generations following them. If they had been without foible they would have been more than human, and our sinful natures would despair of ever reaching such a point of excellence. But seeing where they struggled and fell, where they took heart again and conquered through the grace of God, we are encouraged, 
and led to press over the obstacles that degenerate nature places in our way. God has ever been faithful to punish crime. He sent His prophets to warn the guilty, denounce their sins, and pronounce judgment upon them. We need just such lessons as the Bible gives us, for with the revelation of sin is recorded the retribution which follows. The sorrow and penitence of the guilty, and the wailing of the sin-sick soul, come to us from the past, telling us that man was then, as now, in need of the pardoning mercy of God. Bible history stays the fainting heart with the hope of God's mercy. We need not despair when we see that others have struggled through discouragements like our own, have fallen into temptations even as we have done, and yet have recovered their ground and been blessed of God. The words of inspiration comfort and cheer the erring soul. Although the patriarchs and apostles were subject to human frailties, yet through faith they obtained a good report, fought their battles in the strength of the Lord, and conquered gloriously. Thus may we trust in the virtue of the atoning sacrifice and be overcomers in the name of Jesus. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea! For the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has but a short time. In all ages God's appointed witnesses have exposed themselves to reproach and persecution for the truth's sake. Joseph was maligned and persecuted. David, the chosen messenger of God, was hunted like a beast of prey by his enemies. Stephen was stoned because he preached Christ and him crucified. Paul was imprisoned, beaten with rods, stoned, and finally put to death. John was banished to the Isle of Patmos for the Word of God, and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. These examples of human steadfastness bear witness to the faithfulness of God's promises, of His abiding presence and sustaining grace. They testify to the power of faith to withstand the powers of the world. The season of distress and anguish before us will require a faith that can endure weariness, delay, and hunger, a faith that will not faint though severely tried. Many of all nations and of all classes, high and low, rich and poor, black and white, will be cast into the most unjust and cruel bondage. The beloved of God pass weary days, bound in chains, shut in by prison bars, sentenced to be slain, some apparently left to die of starvation in dark and loathsome dungeons. No human hand is ready to lend them help. Will the Lord forget His people in this trying hour? Did He forget faithful Noah when judgments were visited upon the antediluvian world? Did He forget Lot when the fire came down from heaven to consume the cities of the plain? Did He forget Elijah when the oath of Jezebel threatened him with the fate of the prophets of Baal? Did he forget Jeremiah in the dark and dismal pit of his prison house? Did he forget the three worthies in the fiery furnace? Or Daniel in the den of lions? Though enemies may thrust them into prison, yet dungeon walls cannot cut off the communication between their souls and Christ. One who sees their every weakness, who is acquainted with every trial, is above all earthly powers. And angels will come to them in lonely cells, bringing light and peace from heaven. But seek you first the kingdom of God, and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. This promise will never fail. We cannot enjoy the favor of God unless we comply with the conditions upon which His favor is bestowed. By so doing there will come to us that peace, contentment, and wisdom that the world can neither give nor take away. A humble mind and a grateful heart will elevate us above petty trials and real difficulties. The less earnest, energetic, and vigilant we are in the service of the Master, the more will the mind dwell upon self, magnifying molehills into mountains of difficulty. The burden of God's work, laid upon Moses, made him a man of power. While keeping, for so many years, the flocks of Jethro, he gained an experience that taught him true humility. The command to deliver Israel seemed overwhelming, but, in the fear of God, Moses accepted the trust. Mark the result, he did not bring the work down to his deficiency, but in the strength of God he put forth the most earnest efforts to elevate and sanctify himself for his sacred mission. Moses would never have been prepared for his position of trust had he waited for God to do the work for him. Light from heaven will come to those who feel the need of it, and who seek for it as for hidden treasures. But if we sink down into a state of inactivity, 
willing to be controlled by Satan's power, God will not send his inspiration to us. Unless we exert to the utmost the powers which he has given us, we shall ever remain weak and inefficient. Much prayer and the most vigorous exercise of the mind are necessary if we would be prepared to do the work which God would entrust to us. Many never attain to the position which they might occupy, because they wait for God to do for them that which He has given them power to do for themselves. All who are fitted for usefulness, in this life must be trained by the severest mental and moral discipline, and then God will assist them by combining divine power with human effort. Wrong habits are not overcome by a single effort. Only through long and severe struggle is self-mastered. For the Lord of hosts has purposed, and who shall disannul it? And his hand is stretched out, and who shall turn it back? Each actor in history stands in his lot and place, for God's great work after his own plan will be carried out by men who have prepared themselves to fill positions for good or evil. In opposition to righteousness, men become instruments of unrighteousness. But they are not forced to take this course of action. They need not become instruments of unrighteousness, any more than Cain needed to. Men of all characters, righteous and unrighteous, will stand in their several positions in God's plan. With the characters they have formed, they will act their part in the fulfillment of history. In a crisis, just at the right moment, they will stand in the places they have prepared themselves to fill. Believers and unbelievers will fall into line as witnesses to confirm truth that they themselves do not comprehend. All will cooperate in accomplishing the purposes of God, just as did Annas, Caiaphas, Pilate, and Herod. In putting Christ to death, the priests thought they were carrying out their own purposes, but unconsciously and unintentionally they were fulfilling the purpose of God. God looks into the tiny seed that He Himself has formed, and sees wrapped within it the beautiful flower, the shrub, or the lofty, widespreading tree. So does He see the possibilities in every human being. We are here for a purpose. God has given us His plan for our life, and He desires us to reach the highest standard of development. He desires the youth to cultivate every power of their being, and to bring every faculty into active exercise. Let them look to Christ as the pattern after which they are to be fashioned. The holy ambition that He revealed in His life they are to cherish, an ambition to make the world better for their having lived in it. This is the work to which they are called. You want now to so relate yourself to society and to life that you may answer the purpose of God in your creation. Hopefully this devotional book has been a blessing to you. Go ahead and listen also to the other ones and find the wonderful hidden spiritual treasures in them. God bless.